Fashion trends by definition come and go. The big fashion houses lead the way in creating must-have lifestyle products. And the less well-known brands tend to follow the trend. And there is an increasing number of players which do not shy away from trying to then flood the market with fake designer products. Asian News Magazine tells us in a January 2011 cover story about new trends, Move over, Leopard. The star animal print this year is Snake. It is being featured not just on bags and accessories, but also on dresses. When such fashion trends involve wildlife products, maybe the time has come to reevaluate what is acceptable and might even have been sustainable in the past. Be it fur from seals, chatu shawls from the endangered Tibetan Chiru antelope, or elaborately patterned skins taken from a wide variety of reptiles. With skin patterns like those of tigers and leopards, the industry seems to have graduated to using imitation products. This is not yet the case when it comes to snakes, lizards and crocodile species. The big fashion conglomerates are now represented with their own outlets in all parts of the world. Anywhere they see a potential market. From Cape Town to Zurich to Moscow to Singapore and Hanoi. Their customers are the image conscious elite. Let's look at the story behind a python or water lizard who ends up as a handbag or a wristwatch band, which consumers will find displayed in some of the above outlets. We found that the sales staff we've talked to at some of these shops have little understanding of the supply chain resulting in the products they offer, including, for example, items taken from wild species with the consumer being told that they were captive bred on farms. Unfortunately, the realities on the ground in countries like Indonesia, one of the main suppliers of reptile skins to the world's exclusive fashion houses, are often very different from the world of clean, clear-eyed, worry-free luxury that these shops promise their customers. Carl Aman is a conservationist, author and filmmaker. He researched this story and documented various aspects of the trade with his camera for a larger exposure on the wildlife trade in general and the players trying to control it. A range of strange, sometimes desperate and often shady players are involved in the production process of these skins. With the initial producer ending up with a very small fraction of the amount the end consumer has to hand over for these products. In the case of python skins and water lizards, for example, let's consider the catchers. In Indonesia, they're mostly farmers who work the oil palm plantations that have now displaced the primary rainforest over large parts of this vast island archipelago. Sometimes the catchers follow snake trails they find in the sand. Sometimes they encounter the reptiles on the move. Many have learned that capturing a python is not really difficult. Catch the head, put the one stick. He made a stick. The python goes around the stick instead of around the catcher. It's a good idea. The reptile is approached from behind and can be grabbed by the neck and then a stick is presented and if it is a big python it then wraps itself around it, their natural defensive reaction. The snouts of the larger python species are then bound with duct tape and into the bag they go. Next comes the sale to a regional collector or if a slaughter or skinning house is nearby such middlemen are cut out. The snake is measured and a price is negotiated and accepted. 
Generally, for a three or four meter python with a perfect skin, around 10 US dollars will change hands. The slaughterhouse comes next. The snakes remain stored in these bags for days or sometimes weeks without water or food. Some end up crammed into large wooden holding boxes. We documented that, at least at one of these slaughterhouses, the same traders had expanded the trade beyond the snakes and lizards to other reptiles. In some cases, they do not shy away from buying up fully protected species. This shipment of soft-shell turtles had just arrived from Western Sumatra, destined as a speciality food item to be airshipped to Singapore. The pickup truck also contained a carton box, with the staff telling our translator that it included highly protected pangolins and the worker trying to hide the box behind the wooden board. While waiting for the unloading of the truck, a seller on a motorbike arrived, showing an undersized python which was rejected by the dealer. Another seller on another motorbike then showed up with a number of terrapins, and they were bought despite them also having a fully protected status. A recent workshop discussing the status of the Asian tortoise and the freshwater turtles found that the vast majority are nearing extinction in the wild and very little has been done to address the problem. <laughs> At the python slaughterhouses, slaughter days are normally scheduled two or three times a week. In this case, the order included both the larger reticulated python and the shorter blood python species, which seems more common in the western parts of Sumatra than the larger one. Out of the bags they come. In some cases, hammers are used, and in other cases, iron rods to kill them if they're lucky, and knocking them unconscious if the brain is not hit and destroyed with these blows. As a result, a certain number of these snakes are clearly still alive, waiting to be hung on a hook for further processing. Then they're filled with a water hose to stretch their bodies, and with it the skin, which will make the subsequent removal easier. The snakes are kept in this stretched position for some two or three hours. They're now going through the standard procedure of being filled with water so the pattern, the skin pattern comes out nicely. Next, a razor blade is used to cut the skin down the length of the body. Then, decapitation. In some skinneries, the heads are not removed prior to the skinning of the snake and it can be assumed that they are indeed skinned while still alive. The body is then taken down and fixed with a rope while the skin is pulled off. Then the snake is cut open and the gallbladder removed. <laughs> Which is then dried and sold as a traditional Chinese medicine product. At this point, it becomes clear that several of the female pythons were pregnant and thus clutches of eggs are lost and they will not contribute to the wild stock in future. In what must have been a recently caught snake, there is a rat body in the stomach, still pretty much intact. Now, this uh, cortus that just cut open and found this rat inside, 
and uh, that's obviously one of the functions of pythons and snakes in general and that is getting rid of rodents and that's one of the big issues here uh, is you know is getting rid of all these snakes means uh, the rodents will take over to what extent do they control this pest and to what extent is the offtake of snake going to result in rodents becoming more of a nuisance and more of a pest here The skin goes in a bucket, and so does the meat. Then comes the stretching of the skins by nailing them down on wooden boards. The story concerning the production of water lizard skins, which are also in demand for luxury leather products, is similar. From capture, <laughs> to transport, to sale to rating and evaluation to killing and skinning to stretching and drying of the skins. Indonesia exports annually close to half a million of these lizards in the form of their skins to all parts of the world. The country's Ministry of Tourism nevertheless decided to use a somewhat bigger and more famous Komodo dragon as the flagship species at a tourism exhibit in Moscow, trying to attract tourists to see some live lizards. The slogan, however, was not, watch the big ones and wear the smaller ones. Having elaborated on the animal welfare and cruelty aspect of harvesting reptiles for the fashion industry in places like Indonesia, Let's now also evaluate the criteria of sustainability, which is meant to be guaranteed under the CITES Convention, which governs the trade. The Convention for the International Trade in Endangered Species is a Geneva-based UN body meant to regulate the trade and ensure that it is conducted in a sustainable manner. It approves the export quota of commercially traded species set by the member countries. Control measures are supposedly meant to guarantee that the harvesting of a species will not impact its survival in the wild. An outsider observing a CITES proceeding might conclude that they are governed not by law or principle, not by questions of compliance and enforcement, but by the pleasing sense of solidarity among long-time friends. CITES also allows the export and import of personal effect items from listed species. This without any kind of import or export permit, provided some conditions are met. In the case of Indonesia, we learned that all the second and third rate skins are used to manufacture tourist souvenirs, which are then sold in tourist markets such as Bali. These consumption figures and, as we will later see, all the smuggled skins are not included in the official CITES trade statistics and are not considered when discussing the sustainability aspect. Even the officially agreed on quotas are regularly exceeded.
Even in-flight shopping magazines feature reptile skin products. For instance, the Garuda mail order catalog, Garuda being the national carrier of Indonesia, includes bags and purses from matte snake skin and shiny crocodile patent. This clearly represents commercial trade with no import or export permits involved. Switzerland is the biggest importer of reptile skins originating in Southeast Asia, mostly in service of the watch industry. Switzerland is also the depository country for the CITES Convention, and as such has a special role to play, and is meant to be a shining example in terms of compliance. Switzerland's domestic laws will not allow the import of personal effect items of CITES protected species without a permit. Thus, any tourist arriving with a snakeskin bag bought on Garuda Airlines should legally not be allowed to keep this bag without an appropriate export permit from Indonesia. We went to see the head of the CITES Management Authority of Switzerland and asked him to what extent the contradictory regulations concerning the rules governing the import of personal effect items might create confusion and open up trade loopholes. We have been talking a lot about the interpretation of those personal effects. That there's, there's, there's a working group where we have also always uh, expressed our view how that should be interpreted. Production processes which involve cruelty to animals. Now, we say this is applies to seals, but you know, isn't a python an animal? Of course, it's python and animal, and, and I mean that's the, that's why it will have to be discussed in 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 the context of, of this motion. If those uh, methods that are being used are c c considered cruel, and then the, the political will will have to be shown what has to be done about that. You supposedly were getting an answer from Indonesia. Have you received an answer? So far, I have not been getting an official answer. If I have official documents, then I can ask, I can ask our go government to be more active. But if I don't have, if I only have rumors, that's not sufficient for me as a as a state, as a country official, to to take official actions against the country. Indonesia, in turn, has domestic legislation which stipulates that all reptile skins leaving the country need to be tanned prior to export. A Madan-based dealer explains to us that this creates a major incentive for traders to beat the system and export skins illegally via Malaysia or Singapore. So we tend the skin, not so high technique. The European not so happy. He would like to import the raw material. The same dealer also stated on camera what several of the others confirmed off the record. There are a lot more skins being produced locally than can be exported under the established quota. This is another incentive to smuggle skins to Malaysia and export under their quota, which appears to be a lot higher than anything Malaysia will ever produce themselves. Somebody told me, uh, told me he he get the quota, but not exactly the same skin. Same the other skin to Malaysia, but use the name of skin. So maybe he smuggled from the North Sumatra to Malaysia. An internal document produced by the Directorate General of Forest Protection in Indonesia explains the modus operandi for smuggling skins. Many exports from Malaysia to Singapore are only on paper. Raw skins are illegally shipped from Sumatra to Singapore. Singapore re-exports them as Malaysian origin. The magnitude of this illegal trade is outlined with figures from 2001. While Malaysia for that year recorded an export of 62,000 skins of blood pythons, for the same year Singapore re-exported 166,000 skins which they stated they imported from Malaysia. The same is then confirmed by Officers of Traffic, an NGO which monitors the trade in wildlife at the Kuala Lumpur offices. Based on our study, the results 
show clear indication of how quotas have been exceeded. There are also documented cases of skins being shipped out with fake or stolen CITES permits. This Singapore-based dealer tried to export 16,000 python skins in transit from Sarawak and Borneo. He tried to do this with stolen CITES permits from Malaysia. We tried to get some answers as to the status of the case from a CITES enforcement officer in Singapore, but he was not willing to discuss specifics of the case. As with all such enforcement success stories, the assumption has to be that for each case resulting into some kind of detection or action, 10 cases go unnoticed. When calling in on the CITES Secretariat in Geneva, we were able to interview Juan Carlos Vasquez, who is the Secretariat's communication and outreach officer, who answered some of our questions. We have a small unit, but very active enforcement unit here, and I'm sure that they will be keen to consider any evidence beyond the anecdotal evidence, because everybody is ready to, to say things on PowerPoints, or, but we need to see real evidence. You were saying all this money generated by permits and by the trade. It's huge yeah. amounts of money. Very little, if not nothing, is reinvested into conservation. We have a challenge there. But we need to educate the consumer to make better choices. You will not find many people who still buy a bag after having seen this. So if you're talking about educating the consumer, this is part of educating the consumer. Going back to our friendly dealer in Madan. He also confirms in the interview that he understands the basic market forces as far as the luxury accessory items produced with his skins and what makes the end consumer tick. If you use Helmer's bougie, the price is very, very expensive. Is uh, you, you, you prove that you are a rich, a rich girl. By having Helmer's uh, many the girl are uh, very light. You someone to see, wow, this girl is very, <laughs> very rich girl. Python. He also allowed us to see and film the tens of thousands of skins he holds in storage. Seeing these immense quantities, the question arose, to what extent is he stockpiling to affect market prices? Or maybe he has realized that supplies are declining and that the demand will remain stable or increase therefore anticipating higher future prices. Not all the dealers were as friendly as Mr. Rusan. Another Medan-based skin trader and tannery owner kept us waiting in front of the closed door of his premises after we were told he would arrive for an interview. Next, a police officer showed up to keep a close eye on us and our movements. We got the picture and moved on. We went to Vietnam next. Vietnam is the second biggest exporter of python skins in Southeast Asia. However, compared to Indonesia, Vietnam declares that most of its python skin exports come from captive-born snakes. The dealers in Indonesia, when questioned on the feasibility of breeding pythons in captivity, already made it clear that it would be a lot more costly than buying wild caught specimens. I wonder Vietnam why he can captive breeding. It's a, I think it's, a, it's impossible. We visited a snake farm in the north and first discussed our objectives with the owner of the establishment with translation taking place via mobile phone. We filmed concrete pits with small cobras intertwined and covered by palm leaves. And they showed us some adult cobras in pits in the ground. Eating cobra meat and drinking their blood 
is considered a speciality item by some sections of Vietnamese society. And the meat and blood of a slaughtered cobra goes for around US dollars 120 in this specialized restaurant in Hanoi. Back at the farm and after showing us the cobra breeding setup, they decided to show us the part of the building where they're holding their python collection. The pythons are kept by the dozens in these wooden boxes. There is no sign of any breeding pits or any baby snakes. The owner, however, was happy to offer an annual supply of 1,000 meters of skin at a cost of about 50 US dollars per meter of a dried but not tanned product. The farm we visited in the south is owned by the military and is a for-profit operation which also sells snake wines and a range of other snake-based byproducts. in Vietnam, so a lot of people visit here, uh, so and uh, take care in a room. The official guide spoke quite good English. She showed us the python collection, and we picked the biggest, an eight-year-old reptile weighing some 20 kilograms. And we did the calculation of what it had cost to feed the snake per week, and what it would have cost to get it to its present size in a captive environment. It's a duck or chicken, this time. Say chicken? Yes. How many chicken? About uh, five kilograms chicken, one week, one time. One week, one, one time, five kilos. So that's 250,000 yes. dong every week. Yes. So 250,000 dong is 10, 12 dollars. 12, 15 dollars oh, every this week. One. Yes, very quick. So, so twelve, fifteen dollar every week, uh, fifty weeks a year, or fifty-two. It's about seven, eight hundred kilogram of uh, seven and eight hundred dollar yeah. of chicken yeah. every year. Yeah. So if it's eight year old, it's going maybe about eat about three, four thousand dollar worth of chicken. Again, no small pythons were anywhere in sight. There were no pits in which to keep males and females, as they did with all the other species. So, do you have any small babies from last August? Uh, now, um, now no. Huh? Now, um, no babies. At the end, our lady guide did offer to supply skins in large quantities at the pretty standard rate of about 50 US dollars per meter. If you want to buy a lot of the skin the python, uh, you can give me your number. Okay. Um, I uh, tell me. Uh, I tell the my mini girl. After that, I call you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Fine. You know, big per, per meter of python skin. How much? I mean, ten prepared. One meter. Yeah. One meter about uh, sixty dollars. Once again, when it comes to sustainability issues relating to captive-born versus wild court in CITES declarations, the system does not work. There is little doubt that Vietnam mostly exports skins from wild court snakes, and there is little breeding of pythons going on in captivity. Overall, the policymakers involved in this trade must accept that there are a range of problems when it comes to regulating and then continuing to endorse the status quo, which cannot be justified. We started off by dealing with cruelty and animal welfare issues affecting the trade and the possible infractions of national laws when importing these skins into countries which have specific regulations governing the import of animal products where the production processes involves aspects of cruelty. We decided to further follow up on this issue and consulted Professor Michael Pease, 
a prominent herpetologist and veterinarian at the University of Leipzig. We showed him some of the slaughter footage and to get his viewpoint on pain perception in reptiles and accepted guidelines for the slaughtering or euthanasia of reptiles. Get the snakes into a stage where they cannot react to the further procedures and uh, it's surely animal cruelty and uh, they are still conscious, they still try to get away uh, and surely they, they feel the pain. What we just see is a transaction through the head of a snake and this white area actually is the brain. These are the teeth here. These are all bony structures and you see the brain is located within the bones and it's only a comparably small structure that we have for the whole head. So you have to know exactly that you do not hit here and you do not hit here. You have a definite impact at this point and then the snake will lose consciousness. While the end consumers of luxury brand accessories made out of reptile skins are in most cases not aware of what we have illustrated so far in this documentary, the fashion houses producing the items all seem to claim to adhere to ecologically sound procurement of their raw materials. Such claims simply do not correspond with the realities we documented on the ground. As for industry reactions, the strongest one was from the Swiss Swatch Group. The CEO, Nick Hayek, went on camera after first seeing some of this video material on Swiss TV, stating that his group would no longer use any kind of reptile skins from wild-born reptiles from Southeast Asia. Strong statement, a necessary one, hopefully one which other industry players will follow. Besides major corporations, there is also the state of California in the United States which has decided it can do without python skin. A law going back to the 1970s does not allow the import of such skins and as a consequence even fashion capitals like Los Angeles and Rodeo Drive have to limit what items they offer when it comes to reptile skin products. We also traveled to Paris to get the viewpoint of some of the leading fashion houses using reptile skins in their production lines. We started off with email exchanges with Hermes, the PPR group which includes Gucci, and the LVMH conglomerate which owns the Louis Vuitton brand and Donna Curran among others. We are now outside the head offices of the PPR group here in central Paris. PPR owns the Gucci brand. Gucci is of course a main manufacturer and user of reptile skin products in their accessory lines. The representatives of Gucci did not agree to go on camera but decided to read a statement over the telephone. The LVMH group sent us an email using the CITES convention and having import and export permits as a fig leaf to hide behind. They are consumers of reptile skin products via, via various of their companies. We have approached them for comments, uh, making allegations that they might not have their supply chain under control. Uh, their only response has been an email stating that they're complying in full with CITES and import and export requirements and as such any further questions should be directed at the CITES Secretariat in Geneva. In the meantime they have no problem to also tell their consumers via their web page how environmentally advanced their production practices are. Precious leathers that become fine leather goods. 
Such traditions instill a profound respect for nature, which translates into efforts to preserve beautiful landscapes, protect biodiversity, and ensure consumer health. Harmless production methods and impeccable quality of proven products. Very noble words indeed. If only these sentiments could be extended to some fellow creatures. The reptiles we documented dying in this documentary would probably find it hard to classify their demise being based on a harmless production method. Since the world began, the single most destructive force there's ever been is man. Since the world began, who decimates the plains that once were green? Man. Do I trust you to keep the rhino safe? And do I trust you to keep the leopard free? And do I think you'll steal the poacher's Do I trust you, man? <laughs> Not me. Make way for man. Pay to die, lowly creature. Make way for man. Make way. Yeah.